Highness, Prince Abdulaziz, um, the Minister of Energy from Saudi Arabia. We're also joined by His Excellency Masroor Barzani. He is the Prime Minister of the KRG. And of course, His Excellency Suhail Mazrui, the Minister of Energy right here in the UAE. Gentlemen, welcome. And thank you so much for taking part in a dialogue, which frankly um, is at the forefront of so many conversations that we're having on CNBC today. I just want to take a moment and ask each of you to have a think about how dangerous you find the world to be today. We're talking about inflation, the prospect of stagflation. We're talking about higher energy prices. We're talking about people struggling to afford the basics of life at a time when there is rising violence. And I am not just talking about the conflict in Ukraine today. I'm also talking about the attacks right here at home in the region. Your Royal Highness. Well, you have to define for me what do you mean by danger? There is quite a few definitions now of danger. Uh, I can speak a lot about the type of danger that we were, ha were having here in the region. And it's quite multifaceted, uh, to be honest. Uh, one that has to do with uh, deep, deep national security issues, such as safety of people, first and foremost, such as the ability to continue running our economy uh, at all levels, including ensuring that we continue supplying the world with the required energy. And as you have seen last week, we have made a, a political statement saying clearly that we are no longer responsible on the issue of security of supply, fundamentally because we don't see uh, that uh, there is enough attendance to this issue collective, uh, comprehensive uh, attendance to this issue. So there is a serious issue for us. It certainly it goes without saying that if this uh, security of supply is impacted, it would impact us, certainly our economy, our well-being, uh, our people. But more fundamentally, I think it also will affect the world economy. So you are into a, a period of jittery period defined by unfortunate uh, narrow band approaches where people uh, are focused on their regional issues without looking comprehensively to the impact, the global impact. Sir, and just to follow on to that, was it a mistake for the United States to remove its Patriot missiles from Saudi Arabia? No, I'm not. I'm not uh, into that business. My job is an energy minister. <laughs> but know, it does I, impact I, energy because I, they're targeting I know, I, know, I know how to move oil and I know how to move gas. But I know and I've seen and the world has seen what it means to have a, a city uh, that was supposed to enjoy and did we did enjoy and we will continue to enjoy our living. Uh, formula, you know, the race of Formula One, but two nights before that, uh, uh, some rockets that falls into uh, pump stations and what have you, and disrupt uh, the going concern of our lives, uh, disrupt our environment, and uh, put to question uh, the uh, our ability to supply the world with the necessary in energy uh, requirements. Well, uh, in the old days, we, along with our friends here in the UAE, uh, worked on a, a collective effort to assure and ensure energy security. If these pillars are no longer there, uh, I don't think it is, it should not be too presumptuous that we can handle it. Uh, ourselves alone, be it ourselves as Saudi Arabia. I don't want to speak on behalf of the UAE, but I think I can share with you the thought that we as a GCC country, uh, we have developed and de delivered our side of the story. People, others need to deliver their own side of the commitment. Otherwise, the very pillar of energy security will be Dis uh, disturbed, to say the least. Prime Minister. Well, uh, I, I believe that in different regions, uh,
people have a different definition for danger. Uh, whether the world is a dangerous place to all or not would depend on who you're asking. Uh, of course, there is danger against your own existence. It's about security challenges, economic challenges, food security. All of these can be challenges that we all face at different times. Uh, it's the players, actually, that pose the danger against others. So it's the behavior of the actors that can be studied, that needs to be studied to see what the intentions are and what they want to do. In our case, we see that there is a lot of interferences in, in our region. And unfortunately, sometimes when you see injustice, when you see inequality, there is always the possibility of different reactions to it. And it's the clash of these sort of behaviors that sometimes leads to a dangerous situation. In our case, it's, uh, uh, it, it's always been a dangerous situation for us. And today, with uh, the deterioration of the security in other parts of the world, that the level of danger in our region has also increased. When people feel poorer, they are more likely to uh, do irrational things, and, and their behaviors change according to that. We've seen that in the past, when the rise of uh, terrorist organizations. One of the reasons why uh, some people collaborate with terrorism is because they feel uh, injustice and in inequality. They yeah. feel oppression. And that's what really leads to people to take uh, actions. And that's also true for the states. Yeah. States are also looking at their interests. And what is uh, interesting or can be beneficial to a state may be a danger to another. So once again, the definition of danger uh, varies from place to place. Uh, but I, I believe the world is always can be a dangerous place if we don't control the behavior of the actors. Yeah. You're excellent, Dave. Well, uh, I think, the, I agree, the definition of, of danger varies from one region to another, from one country to another. But I think if we can agree on one thing, the, uh, what is dangerous is poverty, and what is dangerous is, is, is the, and poverty push to terrorism, and those people could be target. So the, we lived in, in a kind of, of uh, a, a, a hope uh, prior to, the, to, to COVID. We had with COVID, and everyone was looking to recover and to build prosperity further. Uh, we are uh, due to, to the geopolitics, the energy security becoming, uh, becoming a priority now, and some countries are forgetting the affordability. And I'm worried about the affordability. Yeah. Uh, that's why His Royal Highness, myself, and, and all of our partners in OPEC Plus, we're trying to maintain that order and bring uh, resources to the market as much as we can at a pace that is reasonable for us. And for that to happen, we need resources, financial resources, we need to invest, and we need to decouple politics from energy availability and energy affordability. I'm worried that because we are mixing the two, we could end up in a situation where energy affordability becoming an issue, and that would definitely lead to, ultimately to poverty, and ultimately could lead to, to a, a stagnation of the world of all the economy. So we are trying, but we cannot be blamed for everything. We're doing our best, and uh, I am worried that if we don't tackle the affordability element, other than the energy security, and the sustainability, which is also very important. So six months ago, we were focusing on sustainability. That was the aim, and no one thought about the energy supply, security, and all of that. 
And suddenly now we're shifting to another element, which is energy security. So we need to have it, and we're selective uh, from one source to another. And I am sure the next is going to be energy affordability and resources of, uh, in, in that sense, because food security is, is becoming an issue, and industrial commodities uh, or, 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 uh, or minerals are becoming an issue as well. So my, the risk I see is, or the danger is poverty, which, is, which could lead to people uh, having to go and join those terrorist groups. And we are one of those reason, regions that are got attacked by terrorist organizations and terrorist groups. And that needs to stop as well if we are going to be committed to develop more resources in the future. Your Royal Highness, yesterday when I was uh, sitting in an exclusive interview with His Excellency al Rui, he told me that Russia is an important part of the OPEC plus alliance. It is the plus in OPEC plus. Um, and that they will remain a part of the alliance. Uh, I don't think if, I just want people to pause and think of the last two years and ask this question. If it wasn't for OPEC Plus, what would have happened to energy security, energy sustainability, and energy market stability? And that, and I go by not only oil, but the broader perspectives of energy. Uh, so I'm not going to be uh, attending for what uh, Russia may do or may do not, but Russia is a country that produces uh, roughly 10 something million barrels a day, which is almost 10% of what the world is consuming. Uh, it also produces a good amount of gas and a major component of the gas. So my uh, reaction to your uh, question is, has to do with the sizable contribution uh, it makes. Now, uh, I listened to Sahel from afar on what he said yesterday about the relevance of the contribution of Russia. I know that we are getting into a tacky, you know, uh, uh, tiptoeing uh, issue. I certainly believe that if it wasn't for OPEC plus existence, we would not be celebrating a sustainable energy market to its level with the even today's uh, uh, volatility because volatility would have been even worse. If OPEC if plus it was, if it, if were not OPEC together. If were not together and did not exist and did not attend to the market, again, let's not forget that April 2020, we had a negative crisis. And if it wasn't for OPEC plus existing, that negative crisis may could have stayed with us for a few more months, I don't know, for until so many people would be ouching and ouching and ouching until more and more barrels will be out of the market. And as you have seen, some of these barrels that went out of the market did not come back. And there are people, serious people, that they wouldn't like to bring more barrels, but the barrels are not coming because the storyline. Uh, sorry, if, sir, if I can take some more time. Uh, my great friend Sultan and I, we were in Glasgow. Uh, he was kind enough to be with me that day when I made my speech. I'm not going to, you know, bet on people's memory that they probably would forget. You could find it, you could see it. In Glasgow, I made a speech, the last paragraph of that speech. I enumerated three things, and it was in Glasgow when everybody was talking about, as Sir was saying, about sustainability, climate change, climate change, climate change. I said, and I would repeat, and I would differ with uh, uh, Dan Jurgen because I was the one who first mentioned security <laughs> of supply at that meeting. I said, the pillars of what we do should be energy security, second, economic sustainability and growth and prosperity, 
Third, and I'm not ranking, but actually I call them the three pillars, climate change attendance. But truly, you cannot attend to climate change without getting energy security. And certainly, if you don't have energy security, you would not have economic prosperity, you would not have economic growth. And if you don't have the two, you would not lose the means of attending to climate change. Yes. In that day, I can see it in faces. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he's the representative of Saudi Arabia bragging about these things. Well, here comes Johnny. Look at what was happening today. Who is talking about climate change now? Yeah. Who is talking about but attending to energy security, first and foremost? Look at the countries that juggled their own energy mix. Look at how much people are advancing the idea of thoughts. We should focus on energy, on oil and gas, and we are pro-producing oil and gas. You will. And pro, and pro, hallelujah, pro, <laughs> using coal. You're pro using coal. No, You're, they are. They are. Your Royal Highness, though there is a moral question, and it's something that a lot of us have been talking about over the last several days here at the World Government Summit, um, which is, of course, the invasion of Ukraine. How do you respond to the critics of OPEC at this point who say you have a moral responsibility Absolutely. We have to reject to, Russia we as have a member? All of, most, all of, well, what I know about Saudi Arabia is that we have voted at the UN clearly, emphatically. We, along with so many uh, of our friends, I think UE also did that. Uh, and we have really separated the issue. The moral, ethical, political thing, I think there is a platform and there is a forum for it. And we discharge our own beliefs, uh, which is consistent with everybody's belief as far as I know. Now, when it comes to OPEC plus, uh, OPEC as OPEC priority, and I would take that privilege of saying I've been at it for the last 35 years, and I know how we managed to compartmentalize our political differences from what is good for the common good or the co common good of all of us. That culture seeped into OPEC Plus. Yes. So when we get into that OPEC meeting room or OPEC building, as you may recall, everybody leaves his politics at the outside door of that building. And that culture has been with us. So if we don't do that, we would not have dealt with so many countries at different times. Could have been with Iraq at one point, it could have been with Iran at one point, it could have been with others as Saudi Arabia. Uh, the reason we have managed to maintain OPEC and maintain OPEC Plus is we discuss these matters and these issues in an entirely, entirely silo type of approach whereby we are much more focused on the common good, regardless of the politics. Your Excellency, um, Mr. Masrui, when you think about that with regards to the conversation we had a week before Putin decided to invade Ukraine, you told me that you had no indication, uh, as a member of OPEC Plus, that there was any invasion forthcoming. You didn't think you would go in. As you gentlemen have so often said to me, the purpose of OPEC, the purpose of OPEC Plus is to stabilize the market, provide stability. How can you possibly trust a partner who literally destabilized global energy prices by invading Ukraine? Which basically uh, fundamentally took a well, dig at what you guys are trying to do. Well, if we mix politics to what we are doing in OPEC, I remember in OPEC and in OPEC Plus, we had countries in war, and they are both partners. We did not take a side. And we're not taking a side today or saying this is right or this is wrong when we are inside the, that organization. We have one mission, and only mission, which is stabilizing the market. So we cannot be politicizing the, or bringing politics into the organization and having that debate. There are other entities or, or ministries that are in charge of that. Our aim is to calm the market, 
trying to come up with volumes as much as possible. And if we are asking anyone to leave, then we are raising the prices. Then we are doing something that is against what the consumers want, what the consumers are crying for in many countries around the world who cannot probably have uh, to afford the, where the prices could go are, can, are asking us to calm the prices, try to bring more resources. How can we contradict with that objective, which serves the whole world by bringing an affordable sources of energy by squeezing or asking to squeeze some of the partners out. We cannot. I mean, if a country decides unilaterally or two countries or five countries, they have all the right to select from which resources they buy. But we cannot, we cannot decide for all of the countries in the world and say, you cannot buy these barrels. I think that is something that is outside the OPEC. If uh, another organization is, is deciding that, uh, and we had sanctions on Iran, we had sanctions on Venezuela, and they were respected members, and we did not do anything against them. So we've been there. We have seen crises. We have seen wars. And, uh, and we stayed uh, at course, and, and we delivered. Just to complement what uh, Suhail was saying, I ask you, who is been throwing these rockets and missiles at us and at Abu Dhabi? Who is financing? Who is training? Who is supplying these weaponry? Is a member of OPEC. I leave it for your imagination. <laughs> Prime Minister, I want to bring you into this conversation because, as His Royal Highness pointed out, um, cynical minds sometimes help. <laughs> this is why, literally, I love this subject. Um, Prime Minister, so not only has the UAE and Saudi Arabia been again and again the target of malign influences from Iran, and I'm talking about the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and their proxies, the Houthi rockets that are coming um, over the border targeting oil and gas infrastructure, um, as well as civilians. But you at home are also a victim of Iranian aggression. Two questions. Are you worried about the fact that the United States seems to be rushing into a new JCPOA deal without a second track to address the malign activities of Iran? And when you take a step back and think about this a bit more broadly about your own uh, economy, how damaging do you believe Iranian aggression is to the KRG specifically? Well, uh, we have been victims of uh, these sorts of aggression uh, for a long time uh, from different sides and different players. Uh, this time, uh, the, uh, the rocket attacks against the Erbil was unjustified. Uh, the allegations are baseless. And, and you're talking about the accusation that Israelis were in that building yes. or that they were part of the conversations? Well, that's what they say. I mean, basically, uh, they uh, attacked the res residence of a private citizen, a businessman. Uh, and then to justify their action, they were saying that they had hit the base uh, of uh, Israelis, which is not true. I mean, this is a But Israelis situation. are part of the dialogue, or not? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, they have nothing to do with this. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they launched these attacks against us in that area, but uh, again, they had to justify it to the international community. And uh, we, uh, uh, we called for an international investigation. We called on the Iraqi federal government and the parliament, and also even invited the Iranians to visit the site and find for themselves that if their claims has any truth to it. Of course, it is, I mean, it's absolutely baseless. Uh, but we understand that this, uh, this is a pressure on us as we are moving forward to form the uh, new government in Iraq. Uh, the formation of the government uh, has not been the way that you know, they want it. So this is a political pressure on the members of the alliance to basically withdraw from the alliance and to let them increase or at least maintain their influence that they have enjoyed 
throughout these years in, in Iraq. So basically one of, the, one of the reasons for these attacks is to give us a warning and uh, also uh, to go back to the energy. We are one of the regions that are flourishing and are trying to become a main player in providing energy, not just to the region, but hopefully to, to Europe and to the rest of the world. As we are discovering more oil and gas fields, and we are trying to develop those areas, I mean, this is something that may not be in the interest of, uh, of the Iranians in this case. So that, that may also be another reason. Uh, but we are trying our best to uh, fill some of the gaps that is uh, that, that some of the, I mean, that this war has left behind in the world, as in, in my speech yesterday I also said, that we are trying to uh, at least provide some of the shortages that exist in, 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 uh, uh, in, in the world. Now, the question is, are we allowed to go and do that? Yeah. Because, again, we see that uh, not only the rockets are trying to stop us, but there are also institutions that have been manipulated. And you're talking about the government in Baghdad, you're talking yes. about the court. Yes, uh, that have been manipulated and they're trying to uh, stop us from uh, doing what we think would be in the best interest of, of our region and uh, the rest of Iraq and also the world. Do you believe that there's any progress you can make on that oil and gas law, are, given the current context? Yes, we are in, uh, uh, we, are, we are negotiating with the federal government. Uh, we are negotiating with uh, the Ministry of Oil. Mm -hmm. And we are insisting that we need to preserve our constitutional rights. Uh, they, you know, the Constitution stipulates and tells us exactly what our rights are and how we should uh, act. And, and also, the Iraqi government knows that. So this is really, it has nothing to do with the Constitution or with the legality of the process. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a political decision made by political appointees to basically put pressure on us at this stage. It's tough for you, though, because when you talk to international investors, you've not only got this problem with Baghdad, but at the end of the day, you're also in severely in debt. Your pipeline's 60% owned by Rosneft, the Russians. Um, and you've, you've got to wonder if that legal battle is going to be resolved in the near to medium term. It's a tough sell when the government in Baghdad is saying you're exporting you know, oil and gas illegally. Well, How do you make that case to the investor? First of all, we have to be careful about who is saying we are selling oil illegally. Uh, we have a constitution uh, that our rights are very clearly shown in, in the Constitution, so we know exactly what we, we can do and we can't do. And then we have a law that was passed by our parliament in 2007, whereas the federal government does not have a hydrocarbon law and still refers to the law that, uh, that's in 1976 from the previous regime. Iraq changed from a central government to a federal government, but the law hasn't changed. Yeah. We have a new constitution. The constitution calls for a hydrocarbon law. In 2007, again, we tried to pass that law at the federal level. It was, once again, the federal government that did not go ahead and uh, pass the law in, in the parliament. So a lawless institution uh, disregarding the constitution, making decisions on an entity that has acted according to the Constitution and has a law. So who is illegal? An illegal, unconstitutional institution is making decisions on us that, have, that are absolutely constitutional and, and lawful. And in this case, we have also uh, taken uh, you know, this interpretation to international lawyers and courts, and they have already decided that what the KRG is doing is absolutely constitutional and there is nothing illegal uh, about it. Uh, we have given assurances to our uh, trading partners, to the IOCs that are operating in Kurdistan, mm -hmm. that Kurdistan will remain committed to honor the contracts that we have with all our partners. Um, Your Excellency, 
Uh, Mr. Masrui, when you think about the volatility that we've seen in oil prices over the last several weeks since the invasion of Ukraine, can you give us a sense of where you see the market headed? Are we going to continue to see these massive price fluctuations? It's very difficult to predict because there are, there are many unknowns. Um, among them is the uh, GCPA and, and, and the, the, the discussion with, uh, with Iran and when Iran is going to come to the market and what volumes would they bring. Um, in addition to the uncertainty of how many more battles we will lose from the group because there is a decline and no one is investing. So unless we have a, a promotion for investments in the hydrocarbon, in many of those member countries and others, uh, including the, uh, the shale oil producers, unless we have uh, that clarity and we, uh, we, we get those resources in place, I think it's always going to be uncertain. What uh, His Royal Highness and myself been warning about for years and years now uh, of lack of investment is very relevant today and it's going to catch up with us down the road. So we need, in my view, to, uh, to incentivize investments. We in the United Arab Emirates are putting those putting investments in place uh, and uh, we will raise the capacity, and that's the production capacity of the country to the five billion barrels, because we believe in the future more barrels will be needed. And we don't see many other countries than us and Saudi Arabia and very few who are putting those resources as countries. The issue that I see as well, the IUCs are not as interested as they used to be in developing more resources. Yeah. And that is, that is driven by the sustainability wave that we had six months ago that uh, made many of the uh, boards of the shareholders of those, of those IUCs telling them limit or decrease your, your, your investments in the hydrocarbon. And that is, to tell you the truth, troublesome because that is not going to put enough resources, even if we, all of our countries, uh, I mean, invest, we need, we need sustainable investments. We believe that there will be growth on demand. We are seeing it. We've been told otherwise, but, it's, uh, but what they told the, the world did not happen. They said, we will be plateauing and yes, the current prices are also, then that's a good thing. They are incentivizing more investments in the renewable energy and we're doing that as well. But I think for the transition, transition will take time and transition will need resources and we need investments. Your Royal Highness, um, does the energy transition come at the cost of energy security or vice versa? Shouldn't. I think there is a uh, good room, and this is what we are doing uh, ourselves. Uh, some of our, I think probably the, 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 without being too unkind to others, but you could see us, you could see the UAE as probably the two good models that are trying to do all of the above. Uh, we are very much focused, for example, on, uh, you know, some friend of mine called me somewhere in April 2020, and he said, are you guys serious at net zero, at, uh, at, at prices at uh, below zero, you have made a statement of investing uh, to create another million barrels? I said, no, we, we, we know that this, that this sub-zero prices will create the environment for that million to be used at some point. I must add that with our own energy mix, we will have an additional million of export capacity. So actually, to the world, it would be roughly two million. So I believe we're doing, at least in, in our case, for ourselves and UAE, we're doing, we have the two of the best uh, companies that can produce renewables in the form of aqua and master. We are all engaged in carbon sequesterization. We have, I, as Saudi Arabia, we have been, in fact, we, we are a, a founding member of the Net Zero Forum. 
with the US and Canada and UAE and uh, Norway and Qatar. We have plugged ourselves in the Methane Initiative. You know why? Because we know that we have a better record, and excuse me, than many other countries, including the US, Canada, with the exception of, of Norway. And I kept telling their minister that Vikings were coming because the Bedouin will come and will take over that. So we have committed ourselves to a net zero uh, 2060 and with technology support and the evolution of technology and the cooperation with everybody uh, uh, in technology development. And again, I have to stress it. We did not put that commitment with a price tag or price support or financing or anything. We were seeking only technological cooperation in delivering us. We have not lost our focus even today with all what is going on. We still, it's cumbersome, it's tough, it's rough, but we can never lose our sight for our future. So what we are doing ourselves is doing both. Attend to this crisis and maintain our course, the course that will deliver us. What we want from the world or our neighborhood or our colleagues in uh, our neighborhood, come to this country, come to Saudi Arabia, come to the other parts of the GCC country, see how much we're doing in converting our countries to countries of joy, hope, and prosperity. Copy what we have been successful with. Avoid the lesson that we learned from our failures. But honestly, we don't want to be handicapped because we have a duty to this generation and the generations to come that as we have enjoyed our life, we owe it to those generations to come that we, again, their inheritance would be secure, safe, prosperous countries. Gentlemen, we're out of time, but I do have one final question to pose to each of you. This is an international audience. There are some very interesting people coming from the West, certainly from the United States. I'd like to ask each of you to tell me and tell this audience what it is that you would like to see from the United States. Your Excellency, Mr. Masrui. Well, United States is a very important partner for all of us, and uh, we are very proud of the relationship. I think what we need is we need uh, pragmatism. We need uh, to look at the objective of the energy and what we are asking for, not to tell us do this or do that. We are expert in our field and we have been doing it for a very long time and we've been successful. So uh, we need their understanding that what we are doing is to the benefit of the consumers, to the benefit of the consumers in the United States, and to the benefits of the consumers worldwide. We're trying to balance the market, and it's not an easy job. We're not the only producers in the world, and we, when we say this is the right way to do it, we know it from experience. So trust us. Prime Minister. Well, U.S. is a great friend. Uh, they have been supporting us uh, throughout these years. We would like them to continue supporting us. And uh, of course, we do support any uh, peace initiative anywhere in the world, but we don't want peace with someone to be on the expense of the stability and the security of someone else. We hope that the United States understands that they have many friends here in the Middle East, but the relationship has to be based on mutual respects and uh, uh, main, ma maintenance of the uh, values and interests that serve both sides. Your Royal Highness. You want my personal opinion or? What would you give me? Very simple. I missed my good friends all over the US. Looking forward to seeing them sometime if we can have a 
a, a period of peace and tranquility where there were I could go and float around New York, Houston, and Washington. I have good, a lot of good friends. Uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, of a history of 80 years of really doing everything to the book on what we can do to be the provider of sustainable energy. And people need not to forget the past because we could regenerate the future if the pillars of the past can stay with us uh, for the future. There's an argument that could be made that the Biden administration has abandoned Saudi Arabia. Do you agree? I would not get myself into political Hadley. You are a fantastic uh, moderator, but my 39 years of government enables me to say, ditch the question and focus <laughs> on the audience. <laughs> Your Excellency, Royal Highness, Prime Minister, thank you so much. Thank you.